Amen. I couldn't sing that song two weeks tomorrow or tonight. I couldn't sing it because I wouldn't sing it, and I wouldn't sing it because I couldn't sing it. I plumbed the depths of depression. Remember how well our fun day went. Just two weeks today. And then the praise in the park. Such a beautiful event. And uh, I know that Stephen, him and I, knitted together for such a time as, as that, that I needed someone. But I experienced a dark place um, the 20th of July and the 21st of July, which only proves that mountaintops have deep valleys at the bottom of them. This morning we were privileged to be part of a God-centered gospel fueled worship service that must have led all who wanted to be led to conclude that Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Amen. <laughs> and everything minus Jesus equals nothing. God's word says, sufficient for the day is the evil thereof. And also, who knows what a day will bring forth. Now I'm nervous about sharing this word because its objective is not to make me the center of attraction or for you to be depressed, but that we all, through my experience, might be built up in the faith to the glory of God. Even after a lovely day in Victoria Park, five churches in the US team ministering together, things went seriously downhill for me. But before I get to that, let me read Ephesians chapter 4, following on from where David was this morning. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk, in the futility of their mind. Have you ever been in that place where everything just seems futile? Do you know what that word means? Pointless. There's no value in anything. And that's the futility of a darkened mind. And the vast majority of the people in the world walk like that. But if a believer to walk like that, something's gone wrong. Let me say it again. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind. Having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. Who, being past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, Putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. 
nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another. Tender hearted. Forgiving one another. Even as God in Christ forgave you. How do you know that you're filled with the Holy Spirit tonight? It's a complex question. And if I was to say, are you filled with the Holy Spirit tonight? Some of you might be tempted to put up your hands. But be careful. Why does it say that we need to continually be filled with the Holy Spirit? Firstly, how do you know if your life is totally dependent on His presence and power? I mean, utterly and totally dependent. Secondly, does this mean that you are free to think, to say and to do whatever you feel like whenever you want? On the second point, let me try to differentiate between these capacities. I was born with natural animal instinct. All human beings have animal instinct. But I was born again with spiritual intuition, which is sometimes sharp and sometimes dull. Instinct competes with intuition, masquerades as intuition. Instinct is from below, intuition is from above. That's my message. But I better elaborate, because you all want to know what terrible sin has he committed. <laughs> and it is a terrible sin. And I will confess it. Not for the sake of your prurient curiosity, but for my need to be transparent. Let me tell you my story. On the 11th of December, 1977, about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, my borrowed prayer was prayed with little faith. But my dull mind recognized that little faith in a great God is enough. The beginning of my new life was found by opening the door to the Holy Spirit. And I would say that, more or less, I've been dependent on the Holy Spirit ever since. Dave shared this morning, small decisions have big consequences. At that time, my desperate cry was immediately answered by an inner conviction of being born again. You can't know what being born again is like until you're born again. You can describe it. You can tell people they need to be born again. You can tell people that they need faith to be born again. But until you're born again, it doesn't actually mean anything. It's the new life. Every disciple knows that life can get really complicated when we take in to us this new life. We find that God then works from the inside out and the devil works from the outside in. So you, in there, represents a battleground. Sometimes we win. Sometimes we feel like we've lost when we take in this new life, it's why we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit who guides us into all truth 
and new life. That is the infinite life of Jesus. Think of that. The infinite life of Jesus dwells inside of you. A finite being. This is rather remarkable, don't you think? The born again experience is not something to be trivialized. It's the most amazing miracle that you could possibly experience. It's more than healing of the body or the soul or the mind. It's a new life. It's come from above. I'd been sharing my bad experience in our elders meeting last Thursday and Glenn prayed about the work of the Holy Spirit. The work of Jesus in his earthly ministry was duplicated perfectly by the Holy Spirit. A bruised reed he will not break, a smoking flax he will not quench. Now I've got to tell you that two weeks ago tomorrow I thought my flax had gone out. Now I know this is a subjective expression and I thought my reed was pulled up and thrown into the gutter. I felt I'd lost everything. I couldn't believe that I'd come from such a high place to such a, an abysmally low place in a few hours. Less than that even. But then there was the Holy Spirit ministry that I experienced on July the 21st, which began the healing process, just as I thought about giving up. So I know that most of you heard my testimony, but I had to return to it myself. And it proved to me that even though I think I've come a long way, I haven't gone very far. Do you ever feel like that? I had to acknowledge that. And just a few days earlier, we'd all been sharing our personal testimonies in uh, Paul Hulibeck's lovely garden. He'd made a lovely meal for us and all the team, US and UK, uh, Wales, were meeting there together. And someone thought it would be a good idea if we introduced ourselves by telling our Jesus story. I'm always ready to tell my Jesus story. I shared how I planned suicide on that day, in the 11th of December, and uh, how our daughter, a brand new Christian, helped me into my new birth by giving me a prayer medallion. And when I read the prayer, I was actually praying the prayer without knowing anything, because I was weeping with desolation, having just made the decision to end my life. And through the tears, I read the prayer and said it out loud. Oh God, give me the serenity to accept what cannot be changed, the courage to change what must be changed, and the wisdom to distinguish the one from the other. That was my miracle moment. Everybody's got a different miracle moment. Sometimes you know when it happened, and other times you don't. If you grew up in a Christian home, you might have just become what you were meant to be in the process of growing up. Oh, God, give me the serenity. That's part one. I certainly didn't have serenity. And I didn't have it two weeks ago tomorrow. This serenity produces two things, both essential to the part two of the prayer. On the one heart, on the one hand, heart serenity must have faith to accept that some things just cannot be changed. You can't erase things. You can't rub them out. If you've done something and it's against God, in other words, it's a sin, you can't rub it out. Only God can do that. And on the other hand, serenity has to exert enough faith to be able to maintain courage to change what must be changed. Now, to be an agent of change does take courage. If Wales needs anything, it needs to be changed. We might be married to people who need to be changed. We might be the sons and daughters of people who need to be changed. We might be the mothers and fathers and grandparents of people 
who need to be changed. We might be neighbors of people who need to be changed, but Wales needs Jesus, needs the Lord. So I got to this low point, and I come to it presently, and I was rehearsing this testimony, and it became for me like a new testimony, because one, I'd lost courage, two, I'd lost my serenity, three, I'd lost the ability to realize that I can't change things, and of course, I'd lost the wisdom to distinguish the one from the other. In other words, I was in a state of confusion. Where did that come from? Who is the author of confusion? As soon as you begin to listen to the voice of the enemy, you will not be able to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. But why did this terrible calamity come upon me? How deep was my valley? Not how green was my valley, how deep was my valley? I found myself in a dark box with walls of unbelief, which I'd made. My attitude came about because of anger and disappointment. And it gave place to the prince of darkness. It says, do not give place to the devil. And then just before that it says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. And I did. And I wouldn't change. I was hanging on to that anger. I was so furious. And I couldn't sleep. Where does peace go then? It's almost as if the devil had me in a, in a neck lock. And I couldn't accept any help from Betty, which was an indication of a terrible condition. That was a nice sound. Yeah, great. When someone you are close to and really love, who you've prayed for for years, suddenly becomes incredibly hostile, that, on top of all the other things that seem to be just under control, suddenly collaborated together to be a monument, or should I say a stronghold, that the devil had built. And it was my own son that was the straw that broke the camel's back. It's not his fault, but I blamed him anyway. It wasn't God's fault, but I blamed him anyway. I got into a strop that was absolutely fatal. You see, I told God, and I'm, this is where I'm, this is my sin, I'm really confessing to you, but it's okay because I've been the Father and He's accepted me. My forgiveness is true. I said, God, I'm disappointed with you. Inside of my black box was a whole pile of unanswered prayers. I don't know if you've got a place like that inside of you. And it's easy to say that delays are not denials. We've got all the answers, but we still have to face up to the fact that they're there. And they're liable to make us collapse. And I know that the enemy's breath was hot on my neck. And I listened to him and closed my heart and my mind and my ears to God. And I'm ashamed. My confession of disappointment in Father was a manifestation of idolatry that's straight out of the pit. I knew I needed to spend time in the last chance saloon. 
I said to Betty, who tried to hug me on Monday morning the 21st, and I couldn't accept the hug. I was standing there stiff in my pride and my anger, not wanting any consolation from the one who was perhaps the most important person to give me that. I said, I must go out. I had things to do that day with the team and couldn't face them. And she covered up for me. He's gone on a pastor's day out. I certainly didn't want to be a pastor. Now I'd frequent, frequented this den of iniquity, the last chance saloon, and escaped its powerful stranglehold almost 37 years ago. But it's almost as if it had never happened. I was just as impotent now as I was on that afternoon when I decided to end my life. Cornered like a rat. That's how I felt. How I came suddenly shut in by the claustrophobic clutches of the enemy, strangling the spiritual life out of me when I'd just been on the mountaintop. How could that happen? And I felt as if death was staring me down, challenging me to go for my gun. And I knew if I did, the barrel would be facing me. To get into an argument with Satan is a very dangerous game. Frustration and anger betray faith and the attitude of heart that becomes a disciple of Jesus Christ. Now the Holy Spirit and the disciple. That's what the message is about tonight. I certainly felt nothing of the Holy Spirit at that moment. But the Holy Spirit was working. I've got three rows on my shelf. I've got a very wide desk which is littered with papers. I've got all my books, the ones that I used to use the most. But I hadn't read this book for over 20 years. And it was kind of hidden, pushed in, and the bigger books were there. Why did I go like that on that and pull this book out? Why? How could the Lord control my hand to pick a book up I didn't want to read anyway? This is God. This is God. He was in recovery mode before I was in death mode. I nearly read the whole book down Cardiff Bay, lying on a towel. But I couldn't start reading the book till I'd cried and said sorry to God. Because I knew if I didn't do that, there'd be no hope. I really feel that. But when I began to read this, here's the chapter headings. Let me just read these chapter headings. This is a classic, Gordon MacDonald, Restoring Your Spiritual Passion. I would not have picked this book off the shelf at that moment by choice. This was the Holy Spirit with the disciple who doesn't even want to be a disciple. Chapter one, it's got to glow in you all the time. I hated that chapter. Doing more and enjoying it less. Well, he's getting my attention now because I was in full agreement. I thought that whatever I do, more is never enough. Have you ever felt like that? More is never enough? It's all over. Now he's got my full attention. I'm in absolute agreement with him. It's all over. Time's up. You're going to preach on that. Time's up. Now I'm beginning to warm to the, to the author running on empty. Now my mind's starting to kick in now. This mind, the Holy Spirit, is now starting to renew my mind from a terrible situation. So I thought, ah, that's why I'm running on empty. I'm starting to nod now. God's got me. I don't feel like he's got me because I could, I could easily just walk away at this point. Well, no, I couldn't actually, but I thought I could. I was still, still in my strop. Further threats to spiritual passion I thought, oh, that, that means it could get worse. So now I'm really hooked into the book. Those who bring joy. Now I'm really sorry that I've caused Betty such pain. 
because she's the one who could have brought me joy. Then I read The Happy and the Hurting. And I thought, it's just such a thin margin between the two things. You can be up there and down there all in the same moment. Friendly fire. I can't tell you about that. But I had some friendly fire. And the worst was that my son was in a bad mood when I wanted to say happy birthday to him. Of course, I haven't stopped loving him, but I did hate him at the time. Chapter 9 really got me. He knew I couldn't handle it. That was it. He knows you can't handle it. You just as well own up. We can't do this journey without the Holy Spirit. It's what's inside that counts. <laughs> Suddenly the blackness began to be kind of gray. Twilight. It wasn't so dark in there. But I'll stop there because the book just goes on. And except there's some good chapters on special friends and more special friends. I hope I'm a special friend to you because you're special as a special friend to me. And that's why Ephesians chapter 4 is so vitally important. It begins with the fact that God has given gifts to the church in order to make the church mature and perfect, which is what David shared with us this morning. We're not going to give up. If you're collapsing inside, let me pray with you. The Holy Spirit wants to fill you. I forgot where I was going now with this. Yeah, of course, the Holy Spirit. I grieved him. As it says in Ephesians chapter 4, grieve not the Holy Spirit. Now, there are two other things you can do against the Holy Spirit. You can quench his power and you can resist him. I guess I'd done both of those things as well without actually identifying those things. So what the, has the Holy, Holy Spirit been teaching me? How has he been healing me and rebuking me at the same time and delivering from the, the condemnation of Satan? Well, he has, because that's his work. He's God. How can I tell the difference between the convicting ministry of the Holy Spirit and the accusing attacks of Satan? Because if you're ever going to distinguish between that which cannot be done, cannot be changed, and that which must be changed, we need the Holy Spirit and his power. So here's some thoughts. Number one, the Holy Spirit puts his finger on a specific sin in your life. And you can wriggle all you want and ignore him all you want, but he won't take his finger off. Praise his name. It's something concrete that I can own and confess. But the accusations of Satan are vague and simply demoralizing. That's all that had happened to me. I was demoralized. I'd lost my everything. Number two, the Holy Spirit shows me Christ, the mighty friend of sinners. But the devil wants me spiraling down into negative self-focus. So I hope you can see where I've come from. I was self-focused. But I'm not normally self-focused. My favorite verse, which I'm hoping to preach now this month, it's from Galatians 2.20. I want, I want to try and preach on this. Sorry, Sandra, I'll have to change the uh, newsletter. But, but I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I want to preach on that verse this month. God willing. Number three, the Holy Spirit leads me to a threshold of new life. Now I know that I'm coming to a tr transition 
in my ministry. And I guess we all are. We're all stepping up to the plate, aren't we? We all want to please the Father. We want Him to be able to trust us. We want to be able to trust each other. That we'd never say anything negative. We'd never say anything ungracious. We'll always be loving. We'll always be kind. We'll always be supportive of one another. Bearing one another's burden, so fulfilling the law of Christ. The law of love. The Holy Spirit leads me to a threshold of new life, but the devil wants to paralyze me where I am. Don't stay where you are. God's got something better for you, for me, for us. We are the church of the living God. He, Jesus Christ, is the head of this church. The life is being transmitted, communicated by an empowering spirit who loves us just like God loves us, just like Jesus loves us. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, He wants the very best for you and me, and for us to be his people. Number four, the Holy Spirit brings peace of heart along with a new hatred of sin. So that I bow before Jesus in re-consecration. But the devil offers peace of mind with smug relief so that I fold my arms and say, there, that's over with. Do you know how close I came to that? Do you know how difficult it is for me who's got a strong sense of duty and devotion that doesn't actually need the Holy Spirit? Because what I do is right, and I do it because it's right. But I need the Holy Spirit to do what is right. I can do things on autopilot. That's our problem. We've stopped thinking. We've stopped actually expecting God to say something to us. God is a God of revelation. And we live in a spirit of the age that's suffering, drowning in information overload. God isn't in the information business. He's in the revelation business. And God is speaking to each one of us tonight as I'm preaching. Because I don't know what I'm going to preach, but I know that He is with us. And He's drawing us on. And we cannot lose when he cried tetelestai from the cross, it was because <clears throat> his work on the cross was finished, his work of redemption was finished, but his work of perfecting us was finished, his work of winning every person to Christ is finished. All we have to do is enter into the objective truth and get on with the business by the power of the Holy Spirit. We're entering into a complete work. Faith is the evidence, isn't it, Dave? of things not seen, the substance of things hoped for. In my dark box, there was no substance because there was no hope. But now I'm standing in a new place. The Lord has lifted me out of that dark place and he set me on a rock which is higher than me. Number five, the Holy Spirit helps me to be so open to God that I allow him to control the conversation between him and me. But the devil tempts me to take off the table certain questions I don't want God to talk to me about. We are thankful for our dear friend, the Holy Spirit. Philippians 4 verse 8. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. That's what the renewed mind thinks about. We're on a journey, and its conclusion, its destination is glorious. But the process God is interested in, so that as we walk together, we become like Jesus. This is the transforming power of vision. The ministry of God the Holy Spirit who leads us to repentance unites us with Christ through new birth. He empowers our discipleship and enables our witness. And I read this 
and wrote it down. During a revival, spiritually dead or dying church members suddenly could think of little but God and his glory. I've come to that place in just one short hour with God and a prayer with Dr. Stephen Lowry who understood exactly where I was coming from. Every day feels like Sunday with nearly universal longing to worship God in spirit and truth. Sins are confessed, wrongs are righted. Church leaders proclaim the word with renewed zeal. Where is God's victory today? Right here with us, his people. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your ultimate rescue plan. We thank you that you are flooding your bride with a flush of excitement as we sense the coming of the bridegroom. We want to surrender to you. We want to ask you to fulfill your promise that when the marriage supper of the Lamb is come, the bride has made herself ready. We want to accept our obligation to pray for Israel and the peace of Jerusalem. Even tonight, Lord, we pray that you break the spirit of Islam, that satanic process yes. that has robbed men and women of the right to love and the right to be free. We pray that you'll heal your church because of its friendship with the world and the world's standards. We ask you, Father, to bring about what is the only solution, a great Holy Spirit revival so that we can be what we were designed and destined to be. Glorify your name, even in each of our lives and in your church here and everywhere. For Jesus' sake, amen. Thank you. Thank you. This is a uh, part one of how do disciples grow? And it's from Hebrews 11. Deacon at our church in North Fort Worth, and I teach 7th and 8th grade Sunday school. I, I, I've got 7th and 8th grade boys that I, uh, that I work with. So I'm going to pretend you guys are 7th and 8th grade boys and just, and just go with that. But it will help if you put your mind.